At this time, we move into that portion of our service where we focus in on what God has to say to us and his message to us this morning as we continue to work through this series we've been going through on Philippians. Paul has these words to share with us from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so Paul gives us this message this morning. And and last week, we had the opportunity to hear about the Reformation and, and what happened in the 16th century where the gospel was rescued. And we heard about what God really thinks of us, which is the heart of the Reformation. What does God think of me? Because 500 years ago, people couldn't go through a single day without that thought passing through their mind. What does God really think of me? And now, in our day and age, I'm I'm not so sure that, that that thought is on the tip of our minds. Now it seems like we have, we have a little bit of a different culture. And, and many have said that the Reformation message really isn't relevant anymore because people aren't worried about what God thinks of them. But to that, my response is always, just go out there and look at how people interact. Because in 21st century America, what is always on the tip of our minds What do you think of me? You see, for us, being justified is as much of an issue as it was 500 years ago. It's just that now for us, we try to be justified. We try to convince ourselves that we're right in the eyes of other people. As we ask, what do you think of me? Do you think I'm pretty? Do you think I'm smart? Do you think I'm funny? And the most important one of all, Do you think I'm right? And we surround ourselves in this culture with with people who think like us, who affirm us, who tell us, yeah, you are right. Yes, you are justified. Because we need so desperately to justify ourselves. And it's into a context like this that Paul writes his message. And and Paul's message to the Philippians this morning speaks to our context because he's warning them about some teachers who will lead them away from Christ. Some teachers who are coming to tell them how to justify themselves. And so at the beginning of the text, you heard what Paul has to say. He says, again, with his refrain in this book of Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. 
And then he, he moves from, from these lighthearted realms of joy into the dark, cold streets of temptation, where the rubber hits the road for joy. And he says, this rejoicing looks like this. Look out. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, if the Philippians didn't know exactly who Paul was talking about here, they were about to find out because there were these Jewish teachers who were going from church to church in the early world, and and if they hadn't come to Philippi already, they were on their way. And these teachers said that in order to justify yourself, the Jesus thing is important, the Jesus thing is good, but to be sure that you are justified, you have to be a part of the tribe. You have to join Israel. You have to be circumcised. This whole Jesus thing is is all cool, but the important thing, the essential thing, the justification comes from circumcision. And Paul, Paul sees right through these guys because Paul knew them. And he knew what it was like to justify himself in this way, to justify himself in this tribe, because Paul was one of that tribe once. He was a part of the tribe, and not only a part, but he excelled in the tribe. And he lists his resume for us this morning. And what does Paul say? He justifies himself in their eyes. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul knew that he was justified in the eyes of these people. In the eyes of humans, he had done everything right. In the eyes of his tribe, he was perfect. He was the man. And yet, and yet Paul's zeal for his tribe wasn't enough for him. Despite all of this zeal he had, despite the fact that he protected these Jews to to the death, despite the fact that he traveled all over the world persecuting Christians for this tribe, he says, this righteousness in the eyes of my tribe wasn't enough for me. I counted it all as loss. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. He was zealous for his tribe. He did everything he could to justify himself in their eyes. But it was all loss for him. What are we zealous for? What are you zealous for? Where do you justify yourself? Where, where do you get in the courtroom on the defensive? Is it, is it when your pride is attacked? Is it when you pre- present an idea in a meeting and all of a sudden you think it's a brilliant idea, people start talking about something else, and so you say, well, that idea was brilliant. You guys obviously didn't consider it enough, so here, I'll bring it up again. And somebody begins to poke fun at it and joke at it, and now, well, now you're offended. And, and, and your, your reaction might be in a playful tone, but you need to justify yourself? Or are we zealous for our families? Is is that our tribe? If, If the teacher writes home that your child was out of line in school today, well, can we handle that? Or, or do we come to the defense of our child and, and begin to, to justify them, to justify our parenting style? Or somebody challenges you and says, well, if raising your kids in the faith is so important, then, then why aren't you here every Sunday? 
And immediately we turn to defending ourselves. We turn, rather than hearing, uh, hearing a brother who cares about us, we turn on the defensive and justify ourselves. If, if, if basketball wasn't every other Sunday, we'd be there every week. Or maybe, maybe we're zealous like me for our own denomination. Some of you might not be aware of the traditions of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but we are a synod who, who is proud of putting Christ in the center of all things. We are a synod who has historically held tenaciously to the word of truth. And having a certain loyalty to this synod is a wonderful thing. But sometimes I wonder if our loyalty and our tenacity turns into idolatry raising the synod as something more important than Christ himself. And, and I, I saw this, own, this idolatry in myself a few weeks ago as I was having a conversation with somebody and, and I told him I was the vicar here at St. Luke's and he said, oh yeah, I thought about going to that church once, but, but then I heard that it was LCMS. Aren't those guys kind of uptight? And, and my, my first thought was, well, no, there's nothing wrong with the LCMS. There's something wrong with you. But of course, I didn't say that because when I began to digest that comment, I realized he's probably a lot more right than I can see. I have spent my entire life in this tribe I've spent my entire life proving myself just in the eyes of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and he's probably right. We probably are kind of uptight, and I probably can't even see it because I'm kind of uptight. And maybe that's the loyalty we have to our tribe. Or maybe our loyalty to our tribe is is the loyalty to the Republican Party or, or to the Democratic Party. And I know that, that many of you have probably already cast your votes. Some of you are looking forward to Tuesday when you get the opportunity to do that. And, and a lot of you are eager for, for us to speak into this election. And so I, I pray that you will hear me sympathetically when I say that there are many Christians in this election who will faithfully think with the church, who will consider the needs of the oppressed. Many will vote for Trump. Many will vote for Biden. Many will vote for another candidate altogether. And many of them will really, truly be thinking with the church. And I encourage you, if you haven't voted already, find an opportunity to vote to think with the church, to consider the cause of those who have been pushed aside by our society, the unborn and the immigrant and the oppressed. But no matter who we vote for, we will truly be able to justify ourselves by that vote only in our own tribe. And if, if the way that we try to justify ourselves is through a vote, well, ultimately, that's a pretty sad thing. Because no matter who this nation elects, it will be a sinful man. It will be a man who is not Jesus. And when he gets into office, he will mess up, whether uh, we hear of it or not. And it may even be a man who carries out or, or allows others to carry out an injustice. But in all of that, we will be okay because Christ is our king over all of the presidents, over all of the government of our land. Christ is king. But my question as we go to the polls this week is who is your tribe? Are you going to try to justify yourself by your vote? Because ultimately you can justify yourself in the eyes of your tribe. You can be zealous there. And Paul knew what it was like to be zealous in the eyes of his tribe. 
And now I know, I know that a lot of our minds are probably going all over the place because of our political reference, but come back with me and hear what Paul says uh, to us because when Paul speaks into our situation. Now, Paul knew what it was like to be zealous for his tribe. Paul knew what it was like to justify himself by what he did in a certain group of people. <laughs> Paul went a little bit further than any of us would. He actually hunted down and killed people who weren't in his tribe. He persecuted the Christian church. And while he was doing that, he is on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. Jesus literally strikes him blind, knocks him off of his high horse, and Jesus pursued him. Jesus brought him into the faith. Jesus says, you're a part of my tribe now, Paul. And Jesus justified Paul in a way that was completely different than all of the justifications that Paul had piled up trying to justify himself. Jesus swipes that pile away because no matter how many times Paul justified himself, he was piling sin on top of sin. Jesus swipes that away and puts his own righteousness in its place. Jesus justifies Paul. And what is Paul's response? He gives up. He completely gives up. And this is what he says. I count everything as loss. All those things that I had done to justify myself, they are a loss to me. They were me running in the wrong direction. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Now how does Paul gain Christ? How, how is Paul found in him? Well, he tells us right in the next verse. He says, I gain Christ. I am found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faithfulness, the faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul says it's not from my own justification. It's not from justifying myself. It's a justification. It's God setting me right with him. Apart from me through Christ's faithfulness. And that's something that he has credited to me because I believed in him. This is, this is a reference even back to the Christ hymn, to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Paul is found in Christ because Christ was found in human form. Because Christ came as a man. Because Christ humbled himself to death. Even death on a cross. So that every time that God looks at Paul, every time God looks at you, he sees you through the cross as one who is right in his eyes. And Paul continues that, that God did all of this so that Paul will know Christ, know his resurrection, and share in his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. You see, for Paul, knowing Christ is more than just cognitively being able to list the things that Christ did. And, it, and it's more than just an, an emotional experience that, that we have, although those might be part of it. Knowing Christ for Paul is having his life be bound up with Christ in the life, death, and resurrection that Christ lives. It is being united to that life, death, and resurrection. Being united to him in his sufferings. For Paul to know Christ is to live life. Now, how do we know Christ? We know Christ in a way very similar to how Paul knows it, by being united to him in his death, resurrection, and eternal life through our baptisms. We are united to Christ's life in baptism. 
We, uh, we know Christ by sharing and having communion with his sufferings as we gather together for communion at the altar where, where Jesus' very own body and blood is shed for you. And we gather and proclaim his death until he comes. We have communion with the sufferings of Christ. We know Christ just like Paul by sitting at his feet, by learning, by hearing his word. Here on Sunday morning, we are knowing Christ. When you go out and have your devotional life in the world, that is knowing Christ. When you have conversations that build each other up in the faith, that is knowing Christ. When you come for pastoral counseling or or to confess your sins and hear Christ's words to you, I forgive you, that is. That is all knowing Christ. You know Christ. And by faith in him, you are united to his life, death, and resurrection. And because of that, God credits Christ's life to you. So it doesn't matter this week or or this month who you are zealous for, who you were zealous for, what tribe you tried to justify yourself in, What matters is that when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. God has justified you. And the fact that God has justified me makes me live my life a little differently. When somebody comes to me and says, Vicar Sam, I'm sorry, but you really messed up here. I don't have to be on the defensive. I don't have to justify myself. I can hear that word. Let it sink in and maybe even repent if that's necessary. But I can repent joyfully because God has justified me. Or if somebody says, Vicar Sam, the guy you voted for is a train wreck. Well, they're probably right, but I can repent. And I can repent joyfully because God justifies me. He makes me right with him If God calls me right, I am right. God justifies you. You are right in his eyes. He says that you are justified. And if God says you're justified, you are justified indeed. Amen.